We respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which our college is built, the Wangal people of the Eora Nation. They educated their children before we were here. It is a privilege to work, learn and play on Wangal ancestral land. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people present with us today. It is a privilege this afternoon to welcome you to this memorial service, commemorating the life of Miss Audrey Keon OAN. I'm Mia Joseph, president of the PLC Sydney ex-students. I extend a warm welcome to Miss Keon's family, and close friends, in particular her nieces, our principal, Dr. Paul Burgess, chairwoman of the College Council, Mrs. Leah Russell, distinguished guests, staff, students, and ex-students. It is only fitting that on this important day, Jersey Day, we commence with a celebration of an important figure in PLC Sydney's history, Miss Audrey Keon, a passionate and committed educator who devoted 43 years of her teaching career to enriching the school experiences of countless PLC Sydney girls. Later in the service today, we will hear recollections from some members of the PLC Sydney community who are very close to Miss Keon. Unfortunately for me, I only had the opportunity to enjoy brief encounters with Miss Keon as I was too young to be a student of hers. I cannot help but feel envious of many of you in this room who were either students or friends of hers and who shared such special connections with Miss Keon. However, I have indirectly benefited from Ms. Keon's legacy in a significant way. I dedicated most of my 13 years at this wonderful school to representative public speaking. I'm personally grateful to Ms. Keon for shaping PLC Sydney into the leading school in this space. My education here and my years beyond school have been richer for the opportunities she helped establish for me. It then, of course, gives me great pleasure to share with you some context around the trajectory of public speaking at our school. I'm grateful to Ms. Bennetts, who worked with Ms. Keon for many years, for sharing some additional context with me. This, of course, only captures a fragment of the legacy Ms. Keon has left at our wonderful school. When Ms. Keon was employed by former principal Ms. Frieda Whitlam in 1959, her role was totally unique in Australia. Schools did not have public speaking programs in place. The creation of this role was simply visionary. During her 43 years at the college, Ms. Keon shaped the public speaking program for all students, including setting up a speech program for our girls in the transition program, which is a special education program for girls in years seven to 12 with mild or moderate intellectual disabilities. Ms. Keon held classes as well for girls who needed extra support. As a result of the foundations Ms. Keon laid, today our school has the largest public speaking teaching unit in any school in Australia. Approximately 700 students are involved in some form of public speaking. There are 12 full-time and part-time staff members who teach our girls, and some of these staff are ex-students. These numbers are astronomical and certainly exceed the number of girls who participated in speech lessons when I was a student here 15 years ago. The fact that our public speaking program now occupies two buildings in the college, Glencourse and the Lions House, demonstrates the strength and prominence of the program. Ms. Keon attended the opening of Lions House in 2010, and I'm sure she took great delight in seeing such recognition of the program she created. Testament to Ms. Keon's legacy and the support of each principal she worked alongside is PLC Sydney's ongoing success in the IGSA Festival of Speech. The competition has existed for 22 years and our school has won the shield 14 times. On a personal note, my young son attends PLC Sydney Preschool and he's already learning the art of public speaking. It's such a pleasure to see him relish the public speaking opportunities offered to all students within our community. And this is yet another example of the mark Ms. Keon has left at our school. Ms. Keon epitomised the PLC Sydney school spirit, including every girl, no matter her strengths or weaknesses, and equipping her with the confidence to take on opportunities. 
in being a visionary for the education of girls and focusing her efforts on developing confident, articulate young women, Miss Keon fulfilled one of the great purposes instilled in us at PLC Sydney. She made the world a better place and life a worthier thing. Miss Keon was trusted by her colleagues and students. She was in every way how a PLC Sydney educator should be. She was not only esteemed for the quality of education she provided our girls, but also greatly admired for her integrity. My peers and I had the immense advantage of benefiting from a well-established public speaking program. May we always remember its history. Today we are going to hear from ex-students and a former member of staff who worked closely with Ms Keon and shared lifelong connections with her. In the spirit of yesterday's celebrations for International Women's Day, we hope you enjoy taking a moment today to honour the impact one woman had and continues to have on generations of other women. In doing so, we also honour Ms Keon's family. I now invite the 2024 school captain, Sarah McPhail, to share a reading with you. Today's reading was shared at Miss Keon's private funeral in December 2023 and was personally selected by her. The reading comes from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way that to the place where I am going, Thomas said to him. Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hello everyone, I'm Robin Boyce, Nee Murdoch, and like Mia, I feel very honoured to be part of this service to celebrate the life and times of the remarkable Miss Audrey Keon at PLC. Therein lies the makings of a novel, and believe me, there is plenty of subject matter. <laughs> Audrey Keon's life was long and eventful, importantly filled with family, friends and work. Her years at PLC provided her with a deeply satisfying, occasionally challenging, and very rewarding career. It was a two-way street. If I can take from the school's tribute in your program, Ms Keon is perhaps one of the most impactful, I love that word, um, and memorable teachers in the school's history. She was forever appreciative of the opportunity to given to her by Ms Whitlam. We often discussed the concept of six degrees of separation, but Audrey was sure that in her case it was just two degrees because she could relate almost anyone or anything back to PLC. <laughs> Didn't she? Um, she cared deeply about the school and her counsel was sought by principals and staff even after her retirement. So it's so wonderful to see so many of you here today, so many ages and stages in her auditorium. Later over afternoon tea, we'll be able to share more memories. How she would love to have been here today. Can you imagine? In reminiscing, I hope that I can paint a picture of the time when I attended the college and thus reflect on many of Miss Keon's qualities that we so loved and admired. For me, it all began in 1961 when, as a slightly bewildered 10-year-old, I arrived at PLC Croydon, as it was then, to board. My thoughtful parents requesting extracurricular ballroom and speech lessons. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, at that time, and for many at such an age, teachers were then remote and sometimes rather stern individuals. Who remembers polishing basketballs outside the staff room for having the audacity to knit Dorcas squares in Mrs. Howan's English class? <laughs> for those who are younger, basketballs were leather then. 
Um, for me, so then, the anticipation of having Miss Keon uh, caused much anxiety. To think that she would be analysing every country sound and then challenging them to meet Trinity College standards. <laughs> and I mean in London, not in Summer Hill. <laughs> How lucky was I that this teacher to be rounding my vowels was Miss Keon, and I'm sure many of you will remember how now, brown cow? <laughs> he was someone who could relate to me, encouraging me to talk about my life at home. She had a particular affinity with the country, having cousins around the Moree area, part of the great northwest, as she called it. Her strong links with the country and her active cosmopolitan lifestyle meant that she could relate to both boarders and day girls. Her social activities were greatly enhanced by her friendship with a rather fast group of young staff, including a certain Di Walker, who amongst others became a lifelong friend. It was always a thrill to watch Miss Walker's arrival each morning as she swept by in her low-slung powder blue sports car, with headscarf flowing behind her and reminding us all of the legendary Isadora Duncan. <laughs> However, back to Miss Keon. <laughs> Miss Keon's private lessons as they were not referred to as elocution, thank goodness, were conducted in the room to the left of the border staircase, which, if my memory serves me correct, doubled as the border's common room when she wasn't using it. Her routine class lessons were conducted in the assembly hall. Her discipline, respectful, never demeaning or sarcastic. I realise now that most of the buildings at the school were not wheelchair accessible, Thus, her daily routine for that time revolved around those two rooms and the adjacent staff room. Another of her responsibilities was to coach those delivering the morning Bible readings. One would meet Miss Keon in the assembly hall and proceed to the lectern to have her guide you patiently but firmly through the reading. I'm sure many are thankful for this tuition when later years invited to be part of more formal services. In class, it was Miss Keon who introduced us to the world of drama and made us feel that when our time came, we could be part of that much anticipated event, the school play. By which time, Miss Keon had our measure. She had a knack for casting both actors and crew. She saw potential in each of us, even if we struggled to see it in ourselves. The experience of producing the school play, in our case, Romeo and Juliet, was a rewarding one but I'm sure that every girl would agree that getting to know Miss Keon was the most important thing. Post-retirement, she particularly enjoyed attending the school plays as a VIP, but the best part, she confided, was going backstage to discuss it with the gals. So in 1965, I was delighted when Lindsay O'Donnell and I were selected as Miss Keon's helpers. This position was filled each year by two boarders in their second last year. Miss Keon did not select her helpers. It was the outgoing helpers who chose their successors. They passed on detailed instructions on how to proceed with care and how exactly to place Silky, the silk scarf that made transitioning in and out of the car quite the speedy manoeuvre. Speaking of speed, Lindsay recalls performing wheelies along the veranda with Miss Keon laughing out loud. I said, Lindsay, surely we didn't do that, but maybe we did. As only a couple of years ago, <coughs> some young carpet layers took her for a spin on her new wheelchair-friendly carpet, where again she was heard laughing joyfully. Her delight in all things never diminished. Lindsay and I would meet Miss Kay each morning, taking the chair from the boot and vice versa in the afternoon. I remember standing on the front veranda outside the dining room, basking in the morning sun, waiting for the crunch on the red gravel as the Hillman mix rounded the corner with the elegantly attired, by David Jones, Miss Keon at the wheel. The afternoon shift was fondly referred to as putting Miss Keon away. <laughs> it's a bit grim, but that's what it was called. Um, putting away often meant long conversations while sharing the Mentos around. These little white lollies lived in the glove box and were particular treat for boarders who are only allowed two shillings worth of McRobinsons on Saturday mornings. 
Putting Miss Keon away was also a plausible excuse for avoiding border sport. Who could argue with, oh, sorry, miss, we had to put Miss Keon away? <laughs> our introduction to the, the introduction, or our year had the introduction of the Wyndham scheme to thank, or not, as most of us thought, to ex which extended school from five years, high school five years to six years. This meant there was no school play in 1965. This hiatus provided an opportunity for me to remain a helper over a two year period and for Miss Keon to, a chance to tour Great Britain. To be travelling around in the land of Shakespeare, Jane Austen and the royal family was a dream come true. Since school days, for many of us, the teacher-pupil relationship has faded as friendships with Audrey developed. We cherished her regular visits to our home and appreciated the effort that it required, but then again, effort was something that Audrey put in to make the most out of life. She spent many eventful times with us in Cooma, never one to miss an occasion. Being widely read and interested in local affairs, she was a wonderful conversationalist and over time shared much about her life. And I was to learn that a woman who greatly influenced and changed her life was Winifred Lang, the physiotherapist who took the young Audrey in hand when others were daunted and made her responsibility her personal mission. Audrey would say that two words summed up or uh, Winifred Lang, determined and strict. For example, Audrey would often be wrapped on the knuckles if her knife and fork was incorrectly held. Is it any wonder that she had set such high standards for herself and for others? The Lang Memorial Prize for Drama was instigated by Audrey in appreciation of her work and acknowledging the fact that Winifred was in fact a former PLC student. Audrey possessed a brilliant memory for all things, albeit literature, events, or people connections. Not so long we were reminiscing, and she said, remember when I asked you to take over the, announcement, the announcing at the pet show? I had absolutely no recall of this. <laughs> However, Audrey went on to describe in intricate detail, as only she could, the incident that required her attention. Now, this would have been mid-60s. Audrey's genuine affection and respect for her pupils played a huge part in bringing girls together. She relished her time as the ex-student liaison officer, a job created in heaven for the greatest networker of all time. Year reunions were a special delight, as were outings to weddings, christenings, and 21sts of former students. Many years ago, she flew to Dubbo to ascend, attend a PLC reunion in Warren. Meeting her at the airport in his turbocharged four-wheel drive was Scott McCalman, husband of Joe Tuck. Scott was recognisable only because he was accompanied by their four-year-old daughter, Harriet, whom Audrey spotted quickly because, well, she was just like Joe. But one example of just how well she knew her pupils. Audrey found joy in every turn. She was delighted to be in touch, whether by phone or in person, in person, her face would light up with that big, warm smile that made you feel as though you were just who she wanted to be with. She was vitally interested in your news and ha happily shared her news, most often with a PLC connection. What a role model for we girls. She was strong, determined, kindly, charming, with a keen sense of humour. Even in this theatre, it makes me smile, as it was not lost on her, that AKT could be construed as ACT, ACT. In today's vernacular, she was one resilient woman. She navigated challenges with grace, never allowing her lack of mobility to define her. It is a powerful lesson that a true essence of a person lies behind the superficial. Those who were privileged to have served as Miss Keon's helpers realised that, in fact, we were the privileged ones. Her enthusiasm for learning and living life to the fullest was inspirational. Consciously or subconsciously, her great legacy was to illustrate what can someone can achieve with determination and flair. We were extraordinarily blessed to have had such an inspiring present as Miss Audrey Keon OAM. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. 
We will now enjoy a performance from Year 11 students Stephanie Chu and Emma Zhang, accompanied by Mr. Bazil. This piece was chosen as it reflects the joy of learning and working together to create something magical, as so many in this room did with, with, with Miss Keon in a production or preparing for a speech, or simply enjoying time with her. On screen, we will share photos from across the years, and we invite ex-students to present a flower in honour of Miss Keon on behalf of their year, production or era at the college.
Well, I made the stairs, which is good. <laughs> My name's Sue McKeith, and uh, it's a privilege to be speaking today, honouring and remembering our colleague and friend, Audrey. I want to reflect on her influence on so many of those who worked with her over the very long period of her professional life and the enduring friendships that developed from this. I'm grateful to the present and former staff members who have helped me with their recollections and impressions of Audrey. I first met Audrey in 1976, when having been interviewed and employed by Miss Whitlam, I joined the English staff. PLC was very different from the schools I had been used to. Firstly, each year group was quite small. As I recall, the smallest year group, year eight, or 4A as it was called, was less than 50 people. So of course the staff numbers were relatively small, just three on the, on the English staff, and Audrey additional to that. She was part of the staff, but also head of her own domain. There was an intimate, old-fashioned air about the school. It was quite cosy and homelike, with the aromas from the productive kitchen in the middle of the school under the control of Mrs. Bridal adding to the atmosphere. The boarding school was a significant element of the school. It was to be remembered, Miss Whitlam would emphasise, that this was the boarder's home. It was clear to this new teacher that Miss Keon was completely trusted by Miss Whitlam, and Audrey always remained her loyal and close friend. Audrey's speech and drama room was also positioned central to the daily action. Close to the dining room and college hall and just near the border stairs. This really reflected Audrey's role and position in the school. It took me a while to understand the subtlety of this and how Audrey was so much more than a teacher of speech. Certainly, she taught the technical aspects of correct pronunciation in a very disciplined way, but ultimately, she was there for the students. Speech and drama was the conduit as was, this, as was the school play for the development of the students into confident, eloquent, capable people, able to convey clearly to others their ideas and opinions. She had the rare quality of being able to give the person she was talking to her complete attention. And I think this is such a common theme that Robbie's already alluded to. This was true in her relations with both students and staff. She remembered the details of people's lives, their family, their circumstances. She enjoyed the students. She loved their individuality, their idiosyncrasies, their foibles. She was very kind and she was fun. Di Walker and Ronnie Webb, who worked alongside Audrey in the early 60s, Remember, there were often visits to the Keon family home in Concord West. There were dinners and lunches at colleagues' homes and at fashionable restaurants in the city. Polo at Warwick Farm was held regularly, and staff members, students and parents would attend, sharing morning tea and a picnic lunch. And of course, there was attendance at ballet and theatre. As Ronnie says, there was always something interesting going on around Audrey. Nothing was impossible and life was grasped for all it could offer. Audrey's love of theatre in all its form and her can-do attitude were enduring features of her life. She continued throughout her teaching career and beyond to regularly attend ballet, theatre and opera throughout the city. She often drove to the venue and various staff members were fortunate to accompany her. This meant experiencing the best seats in the house and the, also the labyrinthine backstage and underground tunnels of Sydney's venues. These theatrical visits always became an occasion, accompanied by great conversation and laughter, debriefing and often by a glass of champagne. 
Everything became an occasion with Audrey. She and I had a running conversation over the years about Sydney's hairdressers. Once I suggested that she could possibly get someone to come to the apartment to cut her hair. She looked at me, eyebrow raised, pityingly really. Where would be the fun in that, she seemed to say. <laughs> she continued to go to her central Sydney hairdresser. Audrey's knowledge of the city of Sydney was phenomenal. It, of course, centred on her favourite store, David Jones, which she frequented as much as was reasonable. She knew the hidden tunnel tunnels underneath the stores, which made access from parking stations possible. Because remember, these were the days where the city was so badly prepared for people in wheelchairs. So ways were worked out. When she was a little girl, recovering from polio and undergoing years of treatment, she was supported by a family friend, a nursing sister, who had met Mr Keown on the ship returning to Australia after his service in World War I. This woman gave Audrey a gift for her 18th birthday. It was a bottle of expensive and rare French perfume. Audrey was overcome by the beauty of this gift. Here was a gift, not for a person living a restricted life in a wheelchair. Here was a gift for someone whose life was ahead of her with all its possibilities. To the very end of her life, this quality of seizing each moment and living each moment to the full was clearly evident. Audrey always understood the power of a special gift Sometimes just a chocolate, sometimes something more. She was a great gift giver. In fact, for many years, she was the staff member charged with choosing the gift for departing staff members. And of course, there was clearly an ulterior motive. It meant more visits to David Jones. <laughs> Audrey had a great sense of personal style. Her outfits were always superbly put together, stylish ensembles and fabulous shoes. She loved shoes and took great care to choose just the right pair. And as mentioned earlier, Audrey had an extraordinary memory. She's been described as our Google before Google. <laughs> she also had an apparently unending supply of stories and she was able to, pro uh, to produce, which she was able to produce at any time. Sometimes they were just a single intriguing sentence, such as, my mother flew with Charles Kingsford Smith. <laughs> a single sentence that invited a leisurely story. No wonder she was such a fabulous dinner party and house guest. Each July, for a number of years, she would drive the eight hours to Gundawindi to stay with Di and Jack Scheinberg and enjoy the country life with their friends, who became her friends. And of course, this was in the days before mobile phones, and Audrey travelled by herself on those journeys. On one such trip, her car left the road somewhere around Moree, and she ended up the right way up but in a field of wheat, almost invisible from the road. She finally heard a car stop, and she called. It's Audrey Keown, and I'm stuck. <laughs> she saw a face loom in the window and heard a voice say, Hello, Audrey. What are you doing there? <laughs> she had scores of cousins in the northwest of New South Wales, and thank goodness this was one of them. <laughs> Audrey was very pleased when Bill McKeith was appointed principal of PLC in 1986. She sent him one of her beautiful handwritten letters to offer her congratulations and support. She was familiar with Bill from his earlier role in the union representing independent school teachers. They had met socially, of course, and Bill already understood her role, her history and her reputation. I believe that she felt that PLC was in safe hands 
and she supported him amongst the ex-students and PLC families when some pushback may have been anticipated due to his youth and gender. In turn, the respect and admiration Bill and the school community had for Audrey resulted in council endorsing his recommendation for Audrey's OAM and then eventually honouring her legacy at PLC in the naming of this theatre. As curriculum offerings in the school changed and demand for academic drama grew, the Year 11 play gave way to the PLC production and additional drama specialists were employed. Audrey retained her speech and drama students and additionally took on the most appropriate role of liaison person between ex-students and the school. A perfect job with her extraordinary knowledge of so many of the ex-students. The continuing close contact and affection between Audrey and the PLC community was illustrated clearly in the formation of Audrey's dream team in 2014. Having learnt that a glitch had occurred in the arrangements around Audrey's in-house evening care in her apartment, and that the only recourse was a stay in a respite facility, which Audrey was dreading, a group of staff members decided to take a hands-on approach. They created a team and a roster, and for about six weeks, swung into action to provide Audrey's care every evening. Helped by this sort of generosity, and with the extraordinary commitment and dedication of Audrey's family members, she was able to stay in her apartment until the end of her life. After retirement from PLC, Audrey also continued to have contact with the drama and music production teams in the school. In recent years, she would attend the dress rehearsal of the PLC production and speak to the cast and crew afterwards. This was always fascinating and the students felt honoured to meet the woman whose name was gracing the theatre. The ongoing contact with music and drama, and especially music, led to the formation of the social bling group, meeting at regular intervals at Audrey's apartment over a number of years for pizza and champagne. This group included partners and the um, young next generation of blingettes. A constant and loving element, central in Audrey's life for many years, has been Marina. Marina Lavoff, Marina Grant, or as I still sometimes think of her, Mr. Darcy in Audrey's 1977 production <laughs> of the stage version of Pride and Prejudice. Marina was part of the dream team and the blings. She was an extraordinary friend to Audrey, as Audrey was to her. Friendship was so central to Audrey's life. And to finish, I'm going to use the words of another lifelong friend of hers. Di Scheinberg writes, what an inspiration Audrey has been to so many of us. She was wise, charming and charismatic. She valued the company of her many friends who felt better for having been in her company. Wale Audrey Keown. Thank you, Mrs. McKeith. One of Miss Keon's favourite songs was Lullaby by Billy Joel. I am pleased to introduce the PLC Sydney Madrigal and Mrs. Casey Allen to the stage.
Ladies and gentlemen, former helpers, students, colleagues, family and friends. Today, we gather not only to mourn the loss of a remarkable woman, but celebrate the extraordinary life of Audrey Keon, affectionately known to many as Ords. I am Tanya Miller, a former boarder from central New South Wales and a privileged helper under the guidance, or as some may call it, her dictatorship in 1999. As Ords once instructed me, I should start the speech with, it's both an honour and a privilege to stand in front of you today. <laughs> Reflecting on that pivotal moment in 1997 when I, a fresh-faced Year 9 boarder, entered the hallowed halls of College Hall for my first speech and drama class, I could not have foreseen the transformative journey that awaited. The demountable classrooms of my small regional town were worlds apart from the grandeur of College Hall. And little did I know that Ords would be the catalyst for profound change in me, admittedly coming from a pretty low base. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Keon, in her wheelchair, defied any preconceived notions of pity or delicacy. Her regal presence, impeccable dress, and an air of authority were my first encounters. As I introduced myself as a boarder from the heart of New South Wales, the connection was instant, sealed by her knowledge of red and black soils and an, understate, and an understanding that transcended the confines of a typical teacher-student relationship. Elevated to the prestigious role of Miss Keon's helper in Year 11, I found myself on a journey that went beyond the professional to the personal. My dear friend Fee and I, under Ord's mentorship, embarked on a year marked by memorable conversations, shared laughter, and moments of delightful forgetfulness on Fee's behalf. Fee seldom recalled her roster, creating ample opportunities for both Miss Keon and I to share laughter over her unreliability. However, I must admit, Fee was quite dependable when it came to the afternoon transfer to the car. I'm unsure whether it was because she didn't want to miss a gossip session with Miss Keon or if she simply craved some cool mints or cool fruits. Miss Keon always had an abundance of those in her glove box. Regardless, it seemed to jog her memory, prompting her to run down to Miss Keon's office where we were often, where we often found ourselves reminiscing about our stories from the bush or discovering yet another small world connection between us. Assisting in the afternoons was always a delightful experience. It provided us both with the chance to engage in relaxed conversations with Miss Keon. I don't believe she initially realised that she had selected two of the most spirited girls in our year group who would often strive to entertain her as much as possible. Once she was safely seated in her car, instead of simply folding her chair and stowing it in the boot, we would occasionally take her wheelchair for a brief joy ride around the roundabout. <laughs> of course, we made sure to thoroughly inspect the mechanics and ensure the track was clear beforehand. It was not uncommon to encounter the gorgeous Mr Foley, the PLC security guard, and a close friend of Audrey's during his patrols around the school. He would often smile and shake his head before swiftly heading towards Miss Keon's car to ensure everything was in order and that she was not experiencing any difficulties in our absence, or maybe it was to distract her from our shenanigans. Miss Keon's ability to transcend her role as a teacher was truly remarkable. Amidst the chaos of our teenage musings, she became a confidant, offering a listening ear and a comforting presence. Her resilience and warmth became guiding beacons, shaping not just our time at PLC, but the years that followed. The annual helpers dinner hosted by Oz was a cherished occasion, providing a glimpse in the depth of her generosity. Transported in her car to her home, we shared stories, laughter and cordial, creating memories that now seem more precious than ever. During my last year, I was delighted to provide a heartfelt, an authentic recommendation for my younger sister, Paula, to become a future helper, knowing that this too would be an amazing opportunity for my sister to make a beautiful and meaningful connection within the school. 
As the years unfolded, Ords evolved from a teacher to a cherished member of our extended family, attending our wedding and making friends with all of our guests, sharing in the joy of special occasions, leaving an indelible mark in our lives. Ords, or Audrey as she was fondly called, was not just a teacher. She was a source of inspiration, a confidant and a surrogate grandmother to our children. I could never have fathomed that I'd be raising my champagne glass with my speech and drama mentor, whom we playfully compared to the Queen of England. <laughs> Nor could I have envisioned addressing her as Ords. It never crossed my mind that the educator who helped enrich my understanding of our remarkable language would one day be guiding my children through their speech and drama performances, celebrating their accomplishments in Estedfords alongside us. In Ords, we found a friend who transcended generations, offering guidance not just in the intricacies of language, but in the art of living a rich and meaningful life. We are humbled by the privilege of knowing her, and as we bid her farewell, we carry forward the lessons she bestowed upon us. Ords, your legacy lives on in our hearts you touched, and we are forever grateful for the gift of your presence in our lives. Thank you. <laughs> Changing tempo slightly. There really is only one person on the planet that I'd come back to the big smoke and do public speaking for uh, in a room full of people who probably did speech and drama lessons. <laughs> but bear with me as I'm really conflicted today um, that she didn't insist on a few with me, but here we are. So yes, following on from my sister, I arrived to PLC in 2001. There weren't many st rural students in the boarding house and sadly even <laughs> less staff who had much interest in rural talk, but in rolls Miss Keon. My family had a couple of hard drought years while I was here and that affected me quite a bit knowing what they were going through to give me this amazing opportunity. No one really understood. Well, actually, probably the bursa did, but Audrey would always check in to see how my parents and the farm were all getting along. Her concerns were always genuinely heartfelt. So when Audrey mentioned she was looking at hanging up her wheels, we did a black market deal that enabled me to be her helper for her final two years. Leaving class a little early or getting there a little late because you're on all its duties. Did I really have to ask her a thousand questions about her life story in our two minute journey to the staff room? just so our time together was extended? Probably not. But I, did I get more out of this than out of science class? Well, yes, my report cards from Mrs Chowdhury can assure you that I did. <laughs> These, in my opinion, and no offence to anyone else, were the golden years of PLC, where the fanciest part of the school was an old red brick pub that had just been bought. We had Macca, the illustrious ship captain, a Humphrey B. Bear-like security guard in Mr Foley, a Florence Nightingale nurse in Sister Bunt, and I'll stop brown nosing at this point, but what I'm getting at is that you couldn't ask for a more dream team that I had in the early 2000s. And then of course, our queen, Miss Keon. PLC was her joy, her other family. And if there was another role she played, and maybe she did, it should have been school ambassador. I've come across a few ex-students along the way after graduating. And of course, you have to make sure first, PLC Sydney, not Pimble. You might have the grounds, but we are the originals. <laughs> 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 anyway, once you have <laughs> confirmation that they are Boundary Street graduates, you then need to suss out their vintage. Some can be decades ahead of you, so there's very few teachers you can have event session on. But mention Audrey's name, and it's like instant street cred. And now there's this new generation pushing through, like kids born when I was leaving. I don't know how they're not still in Brankston and instead drinking at the same pub that I'm at, but either way, they know of Audrey because of this majestic building that honours her unique contribution to PLC. And in that line of thought, and still yet a little randomly like everything else, just recently my mother was at a church in the middle of nowhere, literally. It's a stunning 100-year-old building on a paddock, um, sorry, in a paddock on a river bank with nothing else around. And the other day she came home excited to tell me that one of the attendees was from the famous line of Tux. Her daughter too was a helper and a name I had often heard about. Like seriously, you're in the middle of nowhere and there's an Audrey connection. How, how epic is that and how much would she have loved that story? Her memory recall with past students was unbelievable. 
It wasn't uncommon for you to mention an ex-student from three decades back, and Audrey would just sit there and nod, knowing that this person's daughter's sister's neighbour's niece did Hamlet back with her in the 70s. <laughs> and here I am, already for having forgotten the names of the people I met out in the foyer just before today. <laughs> anyway. Legacies like Audrey's are iconic, and no matter how quickly society moves and shakes, you need to honour these trailblazers for what they are. And she was a trailblazer in every sense of the word. I mean, this woman was literally employed by Whitlam's sister. How vintage is that? <laughs> so, after school, our relationship, like Tan and Robbie, evolved into friendship, and I was forced to stop calling her Miss Keon, then Audrey, and that, when that became easy, it was forever Ords. And wine on the deck in Dremoyne became one of our favourite pastimes. You bring the snacks, Ords would always supply the vino. <laughs> and may I say, I don't know who in this room was her booze supplier, because kudos, honestly, she had one of the best stocked wine fridges I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking as a broke uni student co coming with home brand cheese and crackers that this could quite possibly be Sydney's classiest pre-drinks. <laughs> but getting away on time wasn't ever easy. In case you didn't get the honour of sitting in the sun and sharing wine over her many iconic stories, here is a little one. One of her favourite places in her regal heyday was a day at the polo. And back in the day, the then Prince Charles was playing and visiting her local club. After the game, a small group of the Hootie Ha members, including our Ords, went back to the clubhouse where she mingled with old Charlie and was delighted to be able to reassure this non-royalist that he assimilated perfectly in the crowd, sculling a schooner almost as quickly and cleanly as an Aussie bloke. King Charles hanging out with our Queen Audrey. And I'm not much of a fan, so it's quite big of me to include that part, but she loved them. <laughs> and I loved her, and she really loved that story. From the day I started at PLC, Ords has been a constant in my life. Her love of rural Australia and its people, or our shared passion for conservative values, or just a whinge on all things woke. Or better, or better yet, her favourite thing of all, some spicy PLC goss. Our times at Dremoyne were an absolute pleasure. She was hugely influential in my life, and it was an honour to name our little firecracker daughter, Audrey, after her. And I apologise in advance, she was the whingy one just at the start. <laughs> Anyway, a few months back at Dremoyne, we had our girls do a dramatic recital of a well-known Disney song from the movie Frozen. Our eldest four-year-old almost resembled Elsa, and to Miss Keon's enjoyment, even added some theatrical ballet to her performance. But then it came time for our two-year-old Audrey's rendition, in which Miss Keon sat there <laughs> and, in her words, said, well, that was a bit more like the harker. <laughs> so, after the haka was over, <laughs> Miss Keon pondered for a few more moments and then politely told my husband and I that we should have probably named our firstborn after her instead. <laughs> <laughs> there was no beating about the bush with Ords, and that is really one of the many things we loved most about her. So here we are. Thank you to the extended Keon family for sharing this remarkable lady with us. Thank you to PLC for continuing to honour her legacy with this amazing theatre and, of course, for today's memorial. Thank you to each and every one of you who played a part in her incredible life. And, of course, to the other helpers in the room, thank you for sharing this honourable title with me. How truly amazing was it that she made each of us feel like we were definitely the number one helper? And look, given she's not here to argue, we should all just agree to disagree that, like in most families, the youngest one is usually the favourite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ords, forever remembered and forever missed. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya and Paula. Would you all please stand to sing the school hymn? Oh, Jesus. 
Please be seated. I would like to invite Kathy Dent Thompson, Miss Keon's niece, to the stage. Good afternoon. There's a lot of people here. Um, thank you, Dr. Burgess, and to the ex students, and particularly Philippa for doing so much organising. I am here today representing my siblings, Trish, Alan, Brian, who died in 1994, and Tina. Audrey was our aunt, our father's younger sister. Audrey was born in 1929 a fact that she was a tightly held secret until her 90th birthday, even from us. <laughs> she was the second child of Gus and Kitty Keon. Her elder brother, John, was born in 1927. Gus was from Tumut and had been a great horseman prior to World War I. Kitty was a volunteer nurse, the youngest of 13, from a property at Inverell. They met while Gus was in rehab after losing both legs in the First World War. Gus had man managed to rig up a system whereby he could drive a motorcycle from the sidecar and would take the nurses for a spin. Quite the lad. <laughs> they were married in 1926. Gus got a job in the city at the corner of Martin Place and Pitt Street, working in a kiosk run by the Limbless Soldiers Association. He worked there until just before he died, aged 80. They were a happy family of four, living in Con Queen Street, Concord West, with lots of country cousins coming to visit. Then one day, when she was eight, Audrey woke and couldn't walk. She had contracted polio and everyone's life changed. She was put in isolation, not allowed to see her parents, not allowed to see her brother. John was sent to the country. All of her belongings, toys, books and clothes, everything was burnt. I can't imagine how Audrey must have felt. Going from running around, dancing, riding a bike, to being in an iron lung. And waking up to find the girl in the bed next to you was gone. Then there was the pain of the disease itself. She never really spoke of it. Just like her father never spoke of being stuck in the mud in no man's land. I think she blanked it out. And it was only in later life that she made vague references to that time. But then would quickly move on to another subject, don't want to dwell. Eventually, she transferred for ongoing treatment to Canonbury on Sydney Harbour, run by the AJC, the Australian Jockey Club. There, they were allowed regular visitors, had cakes on Sundays, and lovely doctors, nurses, and physios. And there, she found joy in life again, with lots of fresh air, sunshine, and warm saltwater aquatherapy. She loved when the ladies of the committee came for their regular visits. Oh, such beautiful clothes and hats. They were so glamorous. And sometimes the nurses would come in to show off their finery prior to an evening event. Even when she was young, Audrey loved to see beautiful clothes and accessories. And there she had a bit of a crush, she told me once, on a dashing fighter pilot doctor. But unfortunately, he ended up marrying the prettiest nurse, whom Audrey also liked, so it was a fair compromise. Eventually, Audrey came home and finished her secondary schooling by correspondence. She went on to become a Sunday school teacher at Holy Trinity Concord West. At this stage, she could mobilise with calipers and crutches, but by the late 1950s, she was wheelchair-bound. I don't ever remember seeing her standing, only in photos. There were lots of country weddings and parties. She was one of over 40 cousins on her mother's side, she would join in nearly all social activities available, and this continued until she died. She had missed out on so much when she was young that for the rest of her life she suffered, I felt, dreadfully from FOMO, fear of missing out. <laughs> she was nearly always one of the last to leave a party. Despite her disability, Audrey wanted to work just like everyone else. She chose a career path and she worked towards it. 
but in the late 1950s, it was uncommon to have a teacher in a wheelchair. What foresight Miss Whitlam showed to employ Audrey. Which brings us to the play. For as long as I can remember, August was all about the play, all of us in our childhood. Not her father's birthday on the 1st of August, not my birthday on the 4th of August, not my mum's birthday on the 12th of August, not even Audrey's birthday on the 16th of August. The play was the thing. In the months leading up to the play, there were shopping trips to DJs to find a new outfit, Saturday rehearsals, buying lots of sweets for the nervous cast, and a haircut prior to the first night. <laughs> All five of us kids went to the play at different times. It was almost a rite of passage in our family, much like year 11 in the PLC family. After the play, it was back home where Audrey's mother would be waiting with tea and crumpets. I think our grandmother was relieved when the play was done, but maybe not the night she brought Cuffy home. Cuffy was a terrier dog gifted to Audrey by the cast of Boy with a Cart in 1963. So there was a little dog at home. <laughs> Audrey learned to drive using a system of hand levers instead of foot pedals that her father and brother designed. I find a manual hard enough using my feet, let alone doing it all by hand. So can you imagine getting the clutch, the brake, the accelerator, the indicator, and trying to turn a steering wheel, all with no power steering, steering and only one good arm. As far as I was concerned, Aud was just Aud. She's just part of the family. I never saw what Aud had achieved as being extraordinary. It's just what you did. She has had an impact on my siblings and I, but it's only in the last decade or so that I have come to realise her impact on her PLC family. Audrey had her family life interrupted by polio, but just like her father who spent his adult life in a wheelchair, she wouldn't let, it, let her life be limited by her inability to walk. She travelled to Fiji alone to visit when I was born in 1957. She went sailing with her brother John and his friends on Sydney Harbour. She travelled to England, America, Canada. She loved the theatre, ballet and opera. She loved the Queen. She loved polo. And she loved PLC. But most of all, she loved being with family and friends. But I really think the one thing that she loved most of all was life itself and all the potential that life offered. So farewell, Audrey, and we'll miss you. Thank you. In a moment, I'm going to ask if you would like to join me in prayer to do so. But firstly, I just want to thank Philippa Zingales, all of the staff and students who've enabled this event to come. A very warm welcome to Audrey's family and a warm welcome to everybody who's returned to be with us today. Can we just put our hands together to say thank you for those who organised today? I also want to say in that, Mia Joseph and the Ex-Students Union and the wonderful work that they continue to do, we really appreciate your partnership. Thank you. Would you join with me in prayer? Dear God, we've come today to remember Audrey and we've come to say thank you to you for her. We remember her courage, her grace, her deep generosity towards each of us. And we know that she loved you and that those are gifts that you gave her and those are things that reflect your life here in, and our lives on earth. Thank you for such an extraordinary woman, for somebody who could face such challenges and overcome them and not be bitter because of them, not be hurt because of them, but be generous in response. Thank you for that. It reminds us so much of you. Thank you too that we can gather to remember stories, what a wonderful thing they are, 
and that they enrich our lives. And thank you that Audrey was the great teller of stories, the person who was able to enable us to know how powerful stories are. We pray that you'll bless her and her family and bless us as we depart today. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today as we honour Miss Audrey Claire Keon. We invite you to join us for refreshments under the Camp for Laurel Tree. As you leave the theatre, please enjoy the opera areas playing in the foyer. These were Miss Keon's favourites. Also in the foyer, we have a display of items from Miss Keon's time at the college, donated to our archives by Miss Keon's family. We are very, very grateful for these precious mementos. If it's been a while since you've visited school, we are pleased to offer a college tour at 4.15 p.m., which will leave from the stables. Thompson Hall will open at 4 p.m. for those of you attending reunions. Please enter the hall via the Undercroft, which is opposite the McIndoe Research Centre. On behalf of Dr Burgess and the Ex-Students Union, thank you again for sharing this special service with us today. God be with you till we meet again.